This is Pastor Gabriel Swagger, and welcome once again to another episode of our Crossfire Youth Services. As you can see, the services that we are going to be bringing you is a little bit different than what you would call a normal youth service. And the reason why it's different is simply because we preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We teach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We sing Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So I want you to sit back, enjoy yourself, and I believe that the message we're going to bring you today is anointed by the Holy Spirit. It will be a blessing to your heart and life. So sit back and enjoy the program. Amen. Don't you feel the presence of the Lord here tonight? Amen. He's here to meet your need. Thank you, Jesus. Can we just worship Him in this place?
as we are continuing our study on the seventh chapter of Romans. We're reading just one verse tonight. Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse 15. You can follow along with us. You don't have your Bible up on the screen right above, well, right above us. I've been looking forward to dealing with this verse simply because I think every single one of us has experienced this verse at some point in our life, if not experiencing it right now in your life. It is an interesting statement that Paul would make. Verse 15, Romans chapter 7, verse 15. He would write and say, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. Now I want you to notice something. I know some will will say, a lot of preachers or some preachers or some believers may say that Paul was writing this and this was whenever he was a, you know, he was not saved, he was not spirit filled. Well, no unsaved man would write these words, for that which I do I allow not. For what I would, that do I not, especially this, but what I hate, that I do. No unsaved man would say that. You're dealing with a man who was saved and spirit-filled and doing everything he could to live for God, but there are three things that I find in this text that I have found in my own personal life. The title of this message is Confusion, Frustration, and Wanting to Do Right, But Can't. I want you to think about that. Every single one of us has had confusion, trying to do right, but you don't know how. Every single one of us has been frustrated, trying to do right, but you don't know how. And you've been wanting to do right, but you can't. How frustrating is that? How frustrating. Confusion, frustration, and wanting to do right, but can't. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We're so grateful and thankful that through you the blind can see. That through you the deaf can hear. Through you, the dead are raised. And through you, we are free from the bondages of sin. Lord, I pray that you would anoint our words tonight. Help us to teach. Help us to minister your word. Help these, those that are under the sound of our voice to grasp a hold of what we are wanting to say, what you are wanting to say to us tonight. And we give you the praise and we give you the glory. We give you all the honor. We pray that after this service, that, Lord, you would be lifted up. We hide ourselves behind the cross. We ask that you would ever increase as we, your servants, would ever decrease. Help everyone to see you, not me. Help them to see you and not me. We ask it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Just this morning... Right after I dropped Sam and Abby off at school at Family Christian Academy here, most of you know that every single morning after I drop them off at school, Monday through Friday, before I start my day, I find a place of solitude here around the ministry property, and and I have just a moment of alone time with God where I seek His face for a few moments. I read his word for a few moments, and of course, time varies regarding whatever I have going on that day. This morning, as I was seeking the Lord, it was almost just like as I got there, it was, I was sitting in my truck, and it was almost like the presence of God just filled that truck, and I just began to worship the Lord for a moment, and praise him in tongues, and just not to lift up myself, but it was just, an. it was just, I, I can't explain it except to say that there was just an awesome presence in my truck. Let me tell you something. 
No matter what is going on or what is going wrong or what is going right in your life, when you have that moment where you can sense the presence of God by yourself, that makes everything else just fade away in comparison. I mean, when you can get alone with God and sense His presence and begin to seek His face and begin to feel the presence of God, man, I don't care what the devil has to offer. Nothing can compare to being five minutes alone in the presence of Almighty God. And I begin to study and begin to read His Word. And I just started, as I always, I, I, I just read all the way through from Genesis to Revelation. I take my time because I want to understand what I'm reading. And I just started the book of 1 Kings. And to be honest, there was an excitement when I began this book because I love 1 and 2 Kings. I mean, just, it is, it's, it's phenomenal. But as I was studying and reading on 1 Kings, I was reading about Solomon. There was none like Solomon. A man that, when he took the throne of Israel at the age of 20, knowing his father was David, a man who was looked at by God and called by God a man after mine own heart. It was chosen by God to put Solomon on the throne of Israel. And when asking and seeking the Lord, he would ask him for wisdom. He could have asked the Lord for a myriad of different things, wealth, power, influence. But he ignored all of that and said, Lord, give me wisdom. And when I read those words, I, the first thing that, that came to my mind was, in my heart, I said, Lord, give me wisdom. I know no one will ever match the wisdom of Solomon, but give me wisdom. We need your wisdom to do what you've called us to do, to touch this world for the cause of Christ. We've got to have the wisdom of God. And young people, don't fail to ask him for yourself. No matter how old or young, say, Lord, give me wisdom to, 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 to guide my footsteps, lead my footsteps. Give me wisdom to know what to do. And God began to grant him not only wisdom, but he gave him so much more. And the Bible tells us that during his reign that Israel was at peace. There was a word that was used that caught my attention this morning. It said that Solomon had dominion over all of Israel. There was peace. There was rest. No enemy dared to come up because all had been conquered. Glory to God. His father David conquered all enemies. And when Solomon ruled, it was peace on Israel. And yet, even though that took place, it was a reality, it was a real event some 4,000 years ago, something like that, 3,500, 4,000 years ago, it was speaking also of what is coming very, very soon. You see, Solomon was a type of Jesus Christ, the wisest of us all. There was none wiser than Solomon except Jesus Christ. And during the time of Solomon is a picture of the coming kingdom age where all would be at peace. Every enemy will be defeated. And Jesus Christ will rule supreme on this planet. Glory to God. All will be at peace. He will have dominion over all of the land. But I want you to look at that one word, dominion. There's a great spiritual truth for the believer that I want us to get. It says Solomon had dominion over the land. No enemy would come against him because all was conquered. In the life of a believer, you're either being dominated or you're walking in victory. In other words, sin either has dominion over you or it doesn't. There's no in-between. There's no middle ground. 
Paul, as we would study, we have studied, he would say, for sin does not have dominion over me. But yet, most Christians read that over and over and over and don't really understand what the implications are and what is being said. They find themselves under the dominion of the sin nature. You see, we can only experience victory through Jesus Christ. He's provided it for us. And as Paul would begin to address this simple subject, put that verse back up on the screen here tonight, if you can, just for a moment. He was not experiencing dominion where sin did not have dominion over him. In this verse, in this chapter, he was saying the complete opposite. As I mentioned, you're either walking in victory or you're not. Here, Paul is not. Paul is trying to do something that only the Holy Spirit can do. Paul is trying to walk in a way that only the Holy Spirit can bring about what is needed. Paul is trying to do something and try to earn something that only the Holy Spirit can bring to us and bring to him through Jesus Christ. I'm going to read something here for you just a moment. I want you to get what I'm going to say here. I'm going to use this over and over. The failure to achieve this purpose is found in the fact that Paul is attempting to live a life of victory through his own strength. Not realizing that this life of victory can only be accomplished in the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit who operates only through Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I want you to get that. Here we see in this chapter, in this verse, in the seventh chapter of Romans, Paul trying to operate through his own strength, trying to find victory through his own ability, trying to earn something from God, but only not understanding that what he's trying to do, only the Spirit of God can bring about. Let's dissect this verse before we go on and continue. I want to look at this frustration, confusion, wanting to do right, but can't. It's found in this one sentence. Let's break it down. The first phrase, for that which I do, I allow not. You can see the frustration. You can feel the confusion that Paul is writing about wanting to do right, but you don't know how. And notice that first, that, that word, allow. That word allow means gnosko, which means to know by experience or to understand. In other words, Paul is saying, for that which I do, I understand not. I want to do right. I want to live a godly life. I want to do, I want to, I don't want to go toward the, towards sin. I I, I hate that life. I don't want to do that, but I don't understand how to go from here to here. I don't understand. I'm here right now. I want to be here, but I don't understand how to get there. Can you imagine the frustration? For that which I do, I understand not. He desires to do right. He desires to do good. He desires to go away from sin. But he doesn't understand why he continues to fail. Let's look at that next phrase. For what I would, that do I not. He wants to obey, in other words, for what I would, I want to obey God. I want to obey His Word. I want to obey Jesus Christ, what He tells me to do. But you know what? I can't. I don't understand it. All He knew was to live His life by a certain way. All he knew at the time of his, after his salvation and being spirit-filled, all he knew was to live his life by the means of doing something. Trying to earn something 
from God. And now he thinks, I have it all together. I have figured out the puzzle. I have put together the last puzzle piece. But not understanding that what I want to do and what I would, I don't know how. I'm not sure. I don't know how to get from failure to victory. I thought that by living this life, by means of doing something, that brings me to victory. But it doesn't. And I don't know how. Can you imagine confusion? Just, just, just think about something that confuses you. Think about something that frustrates you. When you get to that point, you want to throw your hands up and say, I can't figure this out. I don't know. Because the very last phrase, he says, but what I hate, it's what I do. I want to render obedience to God, but the very thing that I hate, the very sin that I can't stand, that is what I find myself doing. I want to say it again. Paul is trying to operate and trying to gain a life of victory through the means of his own strength and ability. Something that only can be brought out through the person of the Holy Spirit. So I want to look at this for a moment tonight. Confusion, frustration, wanting to do right, but you can. Let's bring it down to us. Operating in one's own ability. I want to use this as Picture, if you will. Parents, you would know this. When you have children and they're just starting to learn how to do things, when you give a child and they have these toys that develop motor skills, where they have like a box and a top that comes on and off, and on the top it's cut out a square, a circle, a star, a triangle. And then you have those little things that match it, the square, the circle, the star, the triangle. And the whole purpose is for them to take that square and put it in the square. Circle and put it in the circle. Star, put it in the star. Triangle, put it in the triangle. But have you ever noticed and seen a child when they take that and try to take the star and try to shove it in the square? Have you ever watched them do that? To where they take that star and they try to jam it into the square. And they realize it's not working. And over and over and over and over and over till they throw everything down and go, ah! You got, you got kids, you know what I'm talking about. You see the frustration that is on their face. And you see the confusion of this is, I see my daddy do it. I see my mama do it, but I can't do it. And the frustration and the confusion. And you finally get to the place where they're trying to do it and they can't. That is just like the life of the believer. As God has provided a means and a path for victory. We, not understanding that path of victory, we try to accomplish something based on our own abilities. And when that square us, because we're all square, we find that star and we try to force that square into that star. And you say, God, I'm doing this. I'm doing this. Lord, this is what I'm doing. I don't understand it. It's supposed to work. But why is it not working? I hear the path of victory. But Lord, I don't understand why it's not working. You keep trying to jam that square into that star peg. If you're a star hole, if you will. And you get to the place where you've tried so hard. You tried so much that you throw your hands up and you say, I can't do it. You're living this one verse over and over and over again. You're seeing it played out in your own life where you say, look, the thing that I should do, 
I don't. The thing that I don't, I shouldn't do, I do. I don't understand it. God, I'm saved. I'm spirit filled. I read your word. I study your word. I pray. But I can't understand why I'm still failing the way that I am. It's because you're operating on your own strength and ability. You're trying to do something that only the Holy Spirit can do. You see, understand this, young people. This is something that we all have to learn from experience. We don't have the power to bring about victory. I want you to understand that. No matter how holy that you are, no matter how righteous that you may think you are, no matter how good you may be, you don't have the power to gain victory from God. You don't have the power in and of yourself. That's why Jesus said, deny yourself. Deny yourself. It means to understand you can't do it. I mentioned just a moment ago how that every morning I try to find a place of solitude to seek God and to study His Word. And I want to tell you something, church. If you don't do that, you should because you're missing out. But you see, I don't go in there every single morning saying, okay, God, I'm going to spend so many minutes with you and I'm going to read so many minutes or I'll read so many chapters and that earns me something from you. I don't go in there like that because, yes, it will bless you, but that's not the key to victory. Come on now. Man, I witness all the time. There are times on the programs, on television, on Living Waters and on Generation of the Cross and some of you, Adam, and some of the other guys that know Jeremy and Keith, you know that there are times whenever we're teaching the Spirit of God will move and you'll stop and give an altar call, not knowing who's on the other end and not knowing who's watching. But I don't do that and say, Lord, since I said that sinner's prayer for so many people that day that somebody's going to get, that I've earned something from you. But you see, we Christians... That's what we do. It's what we do. We say, God, I've done this, and I've done this. Understand this. I read a statement the other day, and I know Keith and I, we've talked about this any number of times. It's not about receiving, really. I'm going to try to find the right words on this. You can't earn victory. But you can maintain your victory. Oh, my Lord. You can't earn victory. But you can maintain the victory that God has given you. You see, we ha I had to learn this the hard way. To where I myself was that square peg. And trying to jam it in that star hole and saying God I'm doing this I'm doing this God I don't understand it confusion frustration wanting to do right I can't tell you how many times Laying in my bed at night with tears running down my cheeks. With my head in my pillow as to not wake my roommate in college. And saying, God, I don't understand this. I don't understand this. I know I'm saved. I know what you've done for me. But how can I not live for you the way that you want me to? Because I was operating under my own strength and ability. Trying to do something that only the Holy Spirit can do. I know it's awfully quiet in here tonight. <laughs> but I want you to understand something. The moment as a believer. I'm guilty of this more than anybody. 
of saying, Lord, this is what I'm doing for you. There is something on the inside of man that, that tries to accomplish something for God. To try to solve something and fix something and say, Lord, this is what I bring to you. Just think back at Cain and Abel. Cain brought the works of his own hands and laid it on the altar and said, God, this is what I've done. You have to honor this. And I know that we don't think this, we don't say it out loud, and many times we don't mean this, but this is how God looks at this. When you say to God, Lord, this is what I've done, you have to bless me now because I've done this. In the mind of God, what you have just said, what you have just done, the action that you have just taken is saying, Lord, I know what you've accomplished at Calvary's cross, but it wasn't enough. Here's what I have to do. What you accomplished is powerful, as great as it was. It's one thing, but you have to now accept what I have done. You have to accept my sacrifice. You have to sac accept what I have accomplished. You know what God looks at that as? An insult. Have you ever made something for somebody? Food, I can't cook. I can make a sandwich and that's about it. Make a mean sandwich at that too. It's good, man. I take those two pieces of bread. I put them together. You see near the toaster, you got the two slots for the toaster. And most people take the two pieces of bread and put them in the separate slots. I don't do that. I stick them together and put them in one slot. I like the toasty on the outside and mushy on the inside. Mm, it's good stuff. Put those two pieces of bread, take my mustard and slather it all on the right. I say, I'm a quirky guy. I have to do things the same way every single time. I put on my left sock every day, then my right sock. I, as you hear Jill, she's laughing. I put on my left shoe, then my right shoe. If I, if I do anything else, I, I, get all, I get all weirded out and have to start all over. I'm weird, okay? I'm quirky. And so when I make my sandwiches, I do that. I, I put the, ble the bread on the plate, and I have to put the mustard on the right side, mayo on the left side, put the ham or the turkey on the left side, put the cheese on top of that, then take the mustard side and put it, then cut it, and then put it in the microwave and let it simmer for about 35 seconds, and let it all get warm, and I mean, some of y'all starting to get hungry, I can tell. I think I can, oh... Ah, uh, and just drooling, you can dream and you can think about that sandwich, uh-huh. You take that sandwich and you put chips all in the middle of it, and my God Almighty. I take my dip and heat it up, and that's what, I mean, that's what I'm eating tonight. That's what I'm just going to eat tonight, I prom promise you. Make a mean sandwich. But have you ever... Some of y'all going to try that when you get home, I know that. I'm hungry too, so. But have you ever made something for somebody and somebody looked at you and told you, eh, it's all right, but you should have done this? And how you feel? And how that you put almost so much hard work and labor and time, and someone who just sniffs it says, oh, I could have done better. Or you should have added this. You know how, how much of an insult that is? And you take it as an insult. That's what you do to God. God has already provided the means by which we don't have to have the confusion. We don't have to have the frustration. And we don't have to go through, why can't I do right? Because it's already there for you to do right. You see, the instructions has already been laid out. All you've got to do is follow the path. Guys, you know what I'm talking about. When you have something that you got to make, what's the first thing that you do? Toss up the direction. You say, I got this. Last night, I had to put something together for Sam, for her room. The directions were there, and it was all there. It wasn't that hard. I put it together like five minutes, you know, but I didn't want to put the wrong screw in the wrong place and have it looking all weird. So it gives you the guidelines. Take this and do this. 
Then take this piece, put it here. Then take the four screws and put it there. Then use your screwdriver and screw it in together. The Word of God is our map. It's our directions. For the Holy Spirit has already laid it out. Get saved. Get baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then begin to place your faith in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And when you do that, that's when the blessings of God are going to begin to flow. And the Holy Spirit's going to begin to work. But at times we take this. It's already there for us to do. And we say, God, I have a better way. It's an insult to God. You see... Once again, you're trying to do something that only the Holy Spirit can do. You can't bring about your own victory. Only the Holy Spirit can bring it about. But the Holy Spirit only works in one way. Through Christ and Him crucified. You see, singers and musicians, make your way back. To go from there, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. You go from there... To Romans 6, 14, for sin has no more dominion over me. For I'm not under law, but I'm under grace. You see, your answer is found in God's prescribed order. And that order is very simple. Number one, Jesus Christ, you have to understand this, is the source. Always the source. There is no other source. The cross is the means. There is no other means. You can't accept Jesus Christ as Savior without going to the cross. You can't be blessed without going to the cross. You can't have healing without going to the cross. By His stripes, we are healed. You can't have deliverance without going to the cross. It all stems through the cross. Christ is the source. Cross is the means. But how do you receive it? Faith is the key that unlocks that door. I was reading... A humorous story the other day, before I finish up with that. Everybody is so used to having click buttons on their remotes that you go to your car, you no longer have to put the key in the door hole, whatever it's called. You see, we're all used to just having those clickers. And the guy, his battery wore out in his clicker, and he went to the car and it wouldn't he was locked out. He said, I don't know what else to do. So he called Papa Lot. Had to wait an hour. Paid the guy 45 minutes. And the guy looked at him. He said, wait, hold on. He said, you're locked out of your car? Yeah, I can't get in. He said, have you tried to put your, di- your, your key in the, in the... He says, no. He said, I think it will work. Try it. Open the door, and the guy says, $45, please. <laughs> I kid you not. Hey, you, 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 people, you think about that. Some of you, you go, that's going to wind up happening to you. Faith is the key. If you don't have the right key, you can't unlock the blessings. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. If you try to do it by works, it shuts the door, and you can't open it. Last but not least, the Holy Spirit is, he's the one that oversees everything. The moment you plug that key into the right door, Christ and him crucified, your faith is in that. That's when you've opened up the door to the Holy Spirit to say, now I'm going to work because I'm the one that can bring about the change. I'm the one that can bring about the victory. I'm the one that can bring about what you need. Frustration, confusion, trying to do right, but you can't. There's an answer for that. It's called stop trying and start believing. Glory to God. Stop trying. Start believing. Stop trying to earn something. Stop trying to do it and just believe something. As we close, I'm sitting on my bed on a Wednesday evening about 5 p.m. I was in my early 20s before Jill and I got married. It's when we had crossfire on Thursday nights a long time ago. Thank God we don't. Thank God it's back on Wednesday nights. 
And I was sitting on the edge of my bed. I had a little 13, 14, 15 inch TV, whatever it was, and it was on Sports Center. Something I watched a lot back then. I don't watch it very much now unless it's Saturday in football. And I was sitting on the edge of my bed and I was confused. I was in this spot. I was frustrated. I just started to understand the message of the cross, and I really thought in my mind that once I begin to experience this, that everything else was going to be fine. I didn't realize it was just the beginning. And I sat there on the edge of my bed, and I said, I said God, I don't understand this. I thought the cross was supposed to work. He spoke to my heart as clear as I'm speaking to you tonight. He said, do you want to be made free? Now, it took me by surprise because he didn't ask me if I wanted to be set free. That happened at Calvary. He said, do you want to be made free? You shall know the truth and truth shall make you free. You want to be made free? And I said, yeah. His answer to me, just believe. Just believe. Quit trying to do something and just believe it. Quit trying to earn something and just say, Lord, I believe this is where I place my faith. I'm not looking to myself anymore. And that's hard to do. That is hard. And it died. The flesh dies hard. Now, that's a whole nother subject. We'll be here to the rapture teaching on that. I had to come to realization, stop depending upon what I do and start depending on what he's done. We have a saying here, and I've adopted it. Quit trying to do, 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 and start realizing it's done, done, done. Your victory has already been won. You just have to accept it. Believe it. Keep your eyes on Christ and Him crucified and let the Holy Spirit work through you. You see, you're trying to do something that to you it's impossible, but for the Holy Spirit it's easy and it's possible. Amen? Stand to your feet. Hallelujah. Well, let's just lift our hands for a moment. Let's just worship the Lord. Lord, we love you tonight. We thank you. We praise you for your graciousness. We thank you for your grace and your love. Lord, I pray that you would take these humble words tonight, and I pray that it would gain ground in the hearts of those that are here under the sound of our voice and those that are watching and listening. Lord, for those that may have had some struggles of trying to figure out why that things were not working out the way that they should, that they would hear this simple word to realize it's not about me. It's about what Christ has done for me. Lord, I pray that you would bless every person that is here tonight. You're the only one that can bring about victory. You're the only one that could bring about deliverance. And we pray for that right now. We ask that you would move upon the hearts of your people minister to the hearts of your people we ask it in the mighty name of jesus amen and amen let's just worship him whatever they feel led to sing right now let's just that's it just for a moment let's just raise our hands and let's just begin to thank him to worship you My soul rejoice. Take joy, my king. Take joy, my king. In what you hear. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound. Now, before we dismiss, I want us to sing that first worship song, the first praise song, that I'm free. And I want us to leave this place knowing that sin no longer has dominion over me. I'm going to walk out of this place free because of Jesus Christ. I'm going to walk out of this place free knowing it's not what I've done, but what He has done. Come on, let's sing it one right time. That's it.
declaring it, I am free. I want you to declare that in your spirit. And I want you to tell the devil, devil, I'm free. Because of Jesus Christ, I'm free. Because of the blood of Jesus, I'm free. I'm free to dance. Lord, I'm free to live for you. I hope and pray that you've enjoyed today's program. And I really believe it was a blessing to your heart and life. But before we close off and before we sign off for tonight's program, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to tell others about the Crossfire program. I want you to tell your young people, your young adults in your church to tune in every week to our Crossfire Youth Ministry services. And I know as what we are preaching, what we are giving to the people, it will be a blessing. Thank you so much for being with us today. This is Gabriel Swaggart saying we'll see you next time in the Lord.